I think a lot about the humanity behind what we do. Oh, the humanity. I think a lot about that. Um, I come from a user experience background. I'm a design strategist. I have a master's in design methods. Um, one of the things I got really interested in uh, through all the work I've been doing is the, what Dick calls the fourth order problems, fourth order design. How do we actually design groups, make environments for groups of people to do great work together? How does that actually work? I've worked on a number of projects that had brilliant ideas that never see the light of day. Why? A lot of times there's, there's huge amounts of reasons for that, but a lot of times it's just weird interpersonal dynamics that I didn't understand. Um, so I got just really nerdy. I'm nerdy about a lot of things, but I'm really nerdy about how people work together. So I am going to talk about really how we face edges and how we actually work with change. Um, so on a quarterly basis, Gallup does this poll about engagement amongst American workers. And this is from uh, 2011, whatever, a year ago, um, where they found that 71% of American workers are not engaged either disengaged or actively disengaged with their work. And what that means is they're emotionally disconnected from the work that they do. That's a shocking number. Now, it may not reflect in, we're in user experience, we love our work, we're engaged with our work, we're, we're weird like that. Um, but it's interesting because, you know, they also go, they, they define it as they're emotionally, emotionally disconnected from their workplaces and therefore less likely to be productive. And I say, like, not just productivity, but what about creativity and innovation? If people aren't actually connected to what they're doing, how do you, how are you able to go to places that require risk-taking, that require potentially public failure, right? These are really vulnerable places that people need to go to, and you need to be with, you know, in, uh, with what you're doing in order to do that. So I think about creative leadership. We've heard, so I, I use the term creative leadership, design leadership. There's different terms, but the way that I think about creative leadership is that it has three components to it. Um, we just heard a, a lot of great stuff about group creativity. So real, having a real understanding about how groups create together. It's good to understand how creativity works generally, but also how groups do that specifically. Um, there's also the discipline-specific skills, which we're hearing a lot about today. What I'm going to talk about is this um, wonderful little set of acronyms on the right. Anyone know what that, those are? Just not, oh, it's, Sarah has seen this at the Global UX Summit. Spoiler alert. Um, OK, so the acronyms. I think about emotional intelligence. So these, these are the things I think are required for a really strong creative leadership, in addition to those other two. So emotional intelligence, understanding your own emotional landscape. Like, I'm hungry right now, and I also know that when I get hungry, I get cranky. So I know not to schedule meetings at noon because that's just bad, right? So there's emotional, <laughs> some emotional intelligence, understanding your own landscape. Um, social intelligence is understanding you and me. How do we interact with each other? Um, how do you, uh, the dark side is how do you get what you want from someone else? That's maybe the dark side of it, but the upside of it is also how do you get great work from another person? Or how do you uh, navigate the, the halls of the organizations that you work in through building relationships with others. And the third one, which is one you may not be familiar with, is called relationship systems intelligence. And it's, it requires emotional intelligence and social intelligence, but relationship systems intelligence is about take, starting to take a systems view of how groups of people work together. So you think about, you think about a, a couple or a family, right? The couple, you have, you have a husband, wife, husband, husband, wife, wife, whatever. You have two of these. And they come together and they make something, a third something, which is their relationship. And every relationship has a third something to it, right? That is greater than the sum of its parts. So whether that's a team or a couple or a family, we have this extra thing that's, that's there, which is our relationship. And in relationship systems intelligence, we, we, we strive to look at what is this actual system wanting to do. And right now, this system, what's going to happen, wants to happen next is it wants to go eat, right? That's what's probably happening, I'm guessing, but that's what the general thing is happening in this system. Okay, so change. Why talk about change? We heard um, from Daryl yesterday um, just about how everyone always talks about the accelerated rate of change. Um, John Cotter, if, this is a, a really great tactical book on how to lead change. Eight-step process, knock them down, tick them off, um, but he's, he's a change nerd. So 
I brought this out because I like this quote, but by any objective measure, the amount of significant, often traumatic, change in organizations has grown tremendously over the past two decades. Although some people predict that most of the re-engineering, re-strategizing, mergers, downsizing, quality efforts, and cultural renewal projects will soon disappear, I think that's highly unlikely. And I think we can all agree that's not even highly unlikely, it's like definitely unlikely. <laughs> change is just part of, part of the world. How many of you are familiar with Stuart Brand? He's brilliant. He thinks about time in these massive, like, massive, um, like thinking about how things work over huge amounts of time. We often, we're talking quarters here, sprints, two years, maybe three years, he's thinking about centuries. So he has this sort of theory about change. One of them is that things change at different rates, right? Nature changes slowly, culture changes a little faster. As you go up this framework, things change more quickly. You get up to fashion and art and it's like, holy crap, changing all the time. Technology is in that too, we're changing all the time. What I think is really interesting about this is when I, you know, I look at it, I think about just from the way that this is structured is that nature is also changing really fast right now. So one of those things that you could kind of say like, nature sort of changes at this slower rate. You know, it's, that's not what's happening. So change is just, there's a great upheaval um, in where we are right now, but we're human beings. <laughs> so this is a quote from Heraclitus, who was a philosopher, uh, a predecessor or around the same time contemporary of Plato. And uh, Plato actually quotes, quotes this, and I bring this up because um, this is sort of the origin of the only thing that's constant is change. I'm a quote nerd, so I like to find the origins if I can. Um, that's Heraclitus. He's this sort of lonely guy. He was known as uh, Heraclitus the Obscure or Heraclitus the Weeping Philosopher. Um, I just love him because I just, I just, I don't know. I don't know much else about him, but I just love that he's the lone guy because change is kind of a, it can be kind of a, a traumatic event, but the truth is things are always changing. And I find that when we accept that, we just accept, we're, you know, nothing is ever going to be perfect. I used to have this, um, I had this moment. I used to want everything to be perfect. Processes will, everything will, everyone will be happy. All the processes are going to work. We have this beautiful experience we've designed, and then the world there's going to be this like sunshine is going to just light up. It's going to be perfect utopia, which never ever is going to come. <laughs> and I realized when I realized that it was a big moment for me. I realized that we strive for moments of perfection, but a lot of there's just a lot of entropy and chaos. And if we just know that that's true, things just kind of open up because change is actually an awesome source. Of, new, of, new, of newness and possibility. So possibly Ben Franklin, maybe not. Um, when you're finished changing, you're finished, right? So change is kind of like, it's an, it can be a really exciting place for some people. How many people in here find change to be daunting? I mean, come on, right? We all do. Inside. Who loves change? Okay, sure. I do both, I like both, uh, depends on the context. Um, and depends on my level of control over it. So we talk about change, so I talk about this big global level. What do we mean specifically? There's all kinds of change. Changing our seating arrangements. We've got to move to a new, isn't that, like that's one of the most emotional ones, like I got to move where? Sitting next to who? Um, that's a big one. Uh, new features, we need new design principles. We've got to change the homepage, like that's old, right? Change the homepage. Um, new managers, growing the team, prototyping. There's so many things that are change oriented on a, on a, that are change on a regular basis. And each one of these has an effect. So I, uh, I do surf and I love surfing as a metaphor for change because I, it, how many, does anybody in here surf? Okay, bodyboarding. Playing in the waves. Okay, who's played in the waves? Okay, so what's really interesting about the way that the ocean works, right, is that, yes, waves are is a repetitive motion, but every single wave is different. But they're relentless, right? They're always coming. So it's, when you're surfing, you're actually like reading the landscape as things are coming. You're looking out the distance, trying to understand what's gonna happen as something comes closer to you so that you can catch it in such a way that you can actually write it with grace. This person's a nose writer, uh, which is not the like, man, like rip it up, kind of surfing. This is this very graceful form of surfing um, that's almost like dance on a, on a longboard. So that's what we're striving for, is how do we actually dance with change and kind of float on change? I'm going to mix a lot of metaphors. How do we do all that um, in a way that's graceful? So human beings. We work with human beings, and human beings are emotional creatures. We're lots of other things, too. We're analytical, um, we're rational, but we're also, we also have a rich emotional life. 
Um, and what's cool about emotions is that emotions are like weather patterns, right? They kind of, they, they, they blow in and then they blow out, right? You can't stay in a very heightened state of any emotion for a long time or you'll go insane. You can't stay angry for a long time. You can't stay happy for a long time. You can't stay in love for a long time. We have like actually the chemicals change in our body around love, like love is like, like doing coke. Well, more drug references. Like doing coke, right? Being in love is like, it uses those same parts of the brain, but you can't stay up here. You can't stay in love with like, oh God, and like I can't even walk on the ground, I'm so happy. You can't stay there, because you will go insane and you'll never ever accomplish anything. It goes, <laughs> it goes away, right? Um, but so I love thinking about emotions as weather patterns, because that, you know, that, you know when something's hot, in a group, when there's anger in a group, it'll pass, right, if you let it. So let's talk a little bit about emotional process, right? So, so essentially, this is so in like therapists and coaches and a lot of people that we go and see for our personal issues, look at how emotions are processed and make space to allow people to process emotions. And as leaders, we have to do this sometimes and we're not trained to do it, right? I used to like to push the tissues across the table, and you hope, or you take them out of the room, you just hope that, that they'll go talk to someone else about whatever it is that's going on. But if you think about it, you know, emotions, <laughs> here, honey. Um, so if you think about it, emotions, like they'll, it'll, they'll write it out. And what's actually really interesting is that what typically happens is you wanna help people kind of notice what's going on. Oh, I sense some anger here. Maybe kind of like go into that, what is that about? And if you really allow an emotion to fully process, there typically comes a perspective shift on the other side of it, right? It may not be right in the moment, it may be two days from now, but there's typically a perspective shift that allows something new to happen, right? And that's, I mean, if you think about your own experiences, you know, you kind of, you go through something stormy and then out comes another possibility at the end of it. If you allow yourself to do that, and that's, you know, part of this, this like little loop at the top is when we avoid the emotions. Um, when we avoid emotions, which we're also really, really good at. I am awesome at avoiding emotional situations, which is why I do this work, because I need frameworks to help me. Okay, so let's talk about edges. Another nose writer. Isn't that awesome? Like, how does that even work, physics-wise? Okay, so we're gonna talk about the edge, and this is where things get really interesting. So I like frameworks and patterns that help me understand gnarly things. Um, and I like this particular framework for thinking about change. So change happens in patterns. Like there are things that are predictable about the way that change works in the way that human beings are. So, so essentially, you have a primary, which is what's here now. So what's here now is, you got, we're in a conference, right? Where so you guys are sitting at the table. But there's a secondary out there, which is where you might go next, right? And we're, our secondary is we're gonna be going to eat, right? This is not a hard edge to cross, right? We're like, Let's go, right? But edges can be really hard to cross. So let's take another example. Who has a current primary of uh, we have more work than we can handle? Yeah, I was like, yeah, I know I do. Um, we have more work than we can handle. That's the, that's the current situation, right? There's all these possible secondaries that are out there. So do we need to work differently? Do we need new tools? Do we need more people, different processes? Do we need vendors to outsource to? There's all these possibilities out there. So when we select one of those, as leaders, we select, we're, you know what, we're gonna go build uh, prototypes. That's, this, we're, you know, no, no growth, none of this other stuff, we're changing the way we do our work, and I think that that's all about prototyping, for, just to pick an example. So that becomes, the new, that becomes the new primary, right? So then there's other secondaries that are out there. But what's interesting is that these, first of all, it keeps happening like that. But second of all, people cross over edges at different, at different times and different rates. So you may have decided, we're gonna do prototyping, but your team is still sitting over here in the we have too much work to do space, right? And they need to come over to where you are, which is we're gonna use prototypes. So we talk about communication and persuasion and building cases and all of these kinds of things. Um, but what, What's important is to understand what happens at an edge. So think about a time when you, needed, you were gonna take a new job. Let's just use that as an example. And actually, not even at a time you're gonna take a new job, you are thinking about taking a new job. So your primary is in your one place, and over on the other is all these, these possible new jobs. And at some point, you have to make a decision. 
either, you're either going to stay where you are, or you're going to go over the edge to this other place. So imagine, it's kind of like standing at a, at a cliff, right? It's like, if I step over this edge, what's going to happen? There's an enormous amount of uncertainty. Uh, oops. Oh. Ooh. Enormous amount of uncertainty in that place, OK? Um, technology. So it's, it's a, and so you imagine like all the stuff that you do um, at that place. Like, you're going to run spreadsheets, right? Oh, should I really take this job? Is it going to, I need to talk to my friends. Oh, you know, and maybe I don't, I like my boss, actually. He's actually OK. I don't really, uh, and, and if I do that, what's my commute? I can't commute to the peninsula. There's no way I can do this, you know, all of these. You do that like weighing, like, should I change it? Should I not? But there's also a more, an, uh, like a lot of churn that happens there. And that is because change is edgy. So edgy, and I love this, the 12 Angry Men, if you've, this is a great, I love, this, this comes back for all kinds of things, but it's a great example of an organization, of a group of people changing. Um, but yeah, it's an edgy place. People get really angry around edges and other things, not just angry, but it's just an emotional place. And it's because of this discomfort and uncertainty. And really, like, we're hardwired for, for security in a lot of ways. We may intellectually really enjoy changes, but we want to know where our food's coming from. We want to know um, that we have a social, you know, social uh, fabric that to support us, we kind of want to stay here. So moving into places of discomfort and uncertainty is not necessarily easy. So I want to try something. I want you guys to actually just grab the hand of the person next to you and stare directly into their eyes. <laughs> okay, you actually, you don't have to do that unless you're already, okay, unless you don't have to do that. Okay. <laughs> but I want you to experience an edge. OK. <laughs> I mean, if you already did it, congratulations. Um, meet your new, the new love of your life. Um, OK, so I have you do that. What did you guys n notice? The whole room, like, laugh the laughter. Like, and there's this, like, are you shitting me? Like, I see that look, like, this kind of, like, should I, shouldn't I? All these, these are edge behaviors. And every group, I, so I tried to make an exaggerated version of it. but. This is happening. Every time you introduce a change, there's a little bit of this happening. So as leaders, we start, we want to notice. And it's not to notice to fix it. It's just to notice that it's there, right? Um, so edge behaviors, there's uh, different postures. We, you know, this, one, this, this is awesome. This is a total edge behavior, right? I'm not fucking moving. Oh, I did the, I did the F word. OK. <laughs> I'm not moving. I'm not moving. Um, changes in facial expressions or a lack of facial expressions. People go like that. If they don't see me and they don't notice me, I don't have to change anything, right? Just, just, just sink into the wallpaper. Um, giggling, changes in tone. Sometimes people will start to speak with a monotone, which is also really interesting. They'll start to ask questions in a monotone. The other thing people do, change the subject. Like, yes, we, let's, let's, do, like, let's talk about prototyping. Yeah, we'll do that. But you know what? We really need to fix this other process that is, you know, really, it's causing problems for these guys over here, so can we actually talk about that? It's like, let's not talk about this new process, let's talk about this other thing completely unrelated and we'll derail it over there. People don't do this intentionally or with malice, they just, that's just, it happens, right? It's discomfort. You know, in, when I think about discomfort in our culture, we don't like it, typically. A little headache, take a little Advil. You know, it's like anything that's uncomfortable, it's like, just, just put me back in my nice, happy place, right? Happy place. So we don't tolerate it very well. Fidgeting is a big one. Um, unfinished sentences and phrases. A loss of energy. So you think the whole room goes <sighs> That's actually people stepping away from the edge, right? They're like, ugh, can't even, can't even go there. Um, the one I love the most, and this is to notice in yourself, is like the room feels chaotic. You feel, and you feel loss or confused. So there's that sense of like, I don't know what just happened here. Something's happening, and I don't know what to do next. And now, me, I'm a freezer when that happens. I freeze. Um, but that's, that's something that happens in the face of change. So just noticing that these exist, they indicate that an edge is there and that you need to kind of tread carefully. Because if you don't tread super carefully around this emotional place, you can end up in a place it's called realm. I think that pretty much speaks for itself. But realm is when you take a team across an edge too fast, and they, they can't cope with the change, and they become uh, in a very hopeless state. Like, I am never going to be part of this team. Nobody ever listens to me. Everything is always like this. Nothing ever changes. I might as well just quit. Why do I get up in the bed, out of bed in the morning? 
right? It's that like powerlessness, freaked out, dark place. Um, so this is why you want to negotiate the edges. So I'm going to use this example um, with a caveat that I do not have any connections inside of Yahoo. I have no idea. All I know is the media storm that's gone around this and the wild assumptions I'm going to make about it. But I think this is a, do you guys know what I'm talking about? There's a massive change that she introduced, kind of, if you believe the media, through a memo that just appeared in people's boxes, right? You will all come home, back to the, everyone back in, everybody's working in the office, we need you here. That's a huge change for people, right? That affects livelihood, it affects um, uh, relations, family relationships, it affects a huge amount of things. And one way, and we're gonna, we're gonna take the side layoff, the like, that whole thing off the table. We're not talking about what she's maybe trying to accomplish, but just the effect of something like that. She dropped a big change on it, on, on folks. Now she has a huge company, right? And she can't, and she's got really big goals she has to meet. So I don't envy her position at all. But it's a good example because what happened is it's like this kind of shit storm that comes up. And that's, you know, it's, that's a little bit what Realm looks like, right? It's a, it's a so, what happens is you have to start to manage the outcome of the change rather than managing the change before it happens and allowing people to move over that. Because you may not change where it is that you want people to move to, but you want to help them get there, right? So this is that, like, sometimes as managers we're from the side and sometimes we're a little bit in the top down, um, but it's about sort of negotiating this edge. So let's talk about helping teams over an edge. So I I'm a believer in um, taking theory and trying to make it really concrete because so much of this change stuff is like, <laughs> it's like it's so hypothetical. All right, so let's actually, uh, so the first one is ask them to try something out, even if it's for a short period of time. So you want to make something disposable, like make it feel disposable, like I'm not, uh, this isn't going to massively change my life. Um, and sometimes that is actually what you're asking. You're asking them to try something out, right? So let's pilot this new prototyping process for a month and see how it goes, and then we're going to revisit it. Right? So it's like, there's not a, it's like low stakes. We're just gonna, we're gonna try it, right? Um, the second thing to do is model going over the edge for them, which is actually sh uh, showing folks that um, you've, already, you've already kind of seen, you're like the pioneer. I've seen what it looks like art out there. I've already been using this new tool, and here's what I've learned about it. So it's like, oh, it's like, come on, the water's kind of warm over here, it's nice, right? So this is a huge one, is acknowledging discomfort. So change is uncomfortable. So acknowledging discomfort, increasing the size of this team makes me uncomfortable, but I know it's what we need to do, right? You normalize the effects. So actually, we just heard Sarah did that in her, in her talk where she, and, and, and with her group, is this big change, it's an, it's, a, it's an uncomfortable place, but we need to go there. So I'm willing to sit through the discomfort. Will you sit through the discomfort with me, right? Normalizing is a huge part of dealing with emotions in the workplace because we don't talk about them. Like we're like, I'm a big, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm Wonder Woman, <laughs> right? I'm good at, I put on my like, my corporate suit and I can show up and be the person that I'm expected to be. Um, and, and sometimes like emotions are seen as a sign of weakness. Um, but actually there's an enormous amount of strength when you can say I'm uncomfortable but I'm doing it anyway. That's courageous is what that is. So. Okay, so the third one is asking teams to participate in the change. And this is one of the most powerful things you can do. So I like to use these things that they're called for the ground conditions for change. These things have to be in place, and I use them with my clients as a checklist. When you're going to introduce a change as simple as we're moving desks to as crazy as a giant memo that comes from um, corporate that changes people's lives, there are four ground conditions that need to be met for that change um, to happen. So the first one is that everyone has to have the same information. So I don't literally mean that everyone has to have exactly every piece of data that you've ever seen, but think about any change that you introduce, you've gone, like Marissa went through a long, maybe, maybe, went through a long process to think about how she's going to transform the culture at Yahoo. She's done a ton, she's done a ton of thinking about that, right? And she's talked to some people about that. Um, it's a black box when it comes as a memo, none of that thinking is there. Right? And we go, back to, um, oh, we go back to thinking about that process map. Like, if people need to actually process, you need people to have a, a chance 
to sort of to think about something and to come along to the point where they're like, oh, okay, I totally see your thinking. I'm willing to, I'm willing to try it. So getting context and information into the, into the relationship, into the system. Um, the second is that there needs to be a sense of shared purpose. So this is about tying the change into mission, right? And, and helping people see that connection. So we did see that in Marissa's thing. It said, uh, we need to build a culture where there's serendipity and water cooler kinds of stuff happening in the office, therefore this exists, right? So she tied it to, she did sort of tie it to um, larger sense of purpose. But that's, you know, people, it's, it's results oriented. I wanna, I want, people wanna be part of something. The third one is, um, this, and this is actually really critical, you need, everyone needs to understand when or if they're gonna have input into the change, right? So, um, and they may or may not. This is, a, this is, they need to understand if and when they will have it. So this doesn't mean that you have to have input on every single change you introduce, but people need to understand when and when they're not gonna have a lot of input. Because we operate under crazy short timelines, and sometimes we can't have we can't work on a consensus model, right? We can't, like, literal consensus. But people need to, they need to understand that. So this is about just being clear. You know what, you, I will take input, but, um, well, this is actually the second part. I will take input, but the fourth, this is the fourth part, is everyone needs to understand what's gonna happen to that input. So these two go together, right? It's not just enough to take, say, I'm gonna take input, you gotta tell them what you're gonna do with it. And if you're not gonna do anything with it, you gotta say that too. Right? Because what happens is, you, you all done those things where you guys give, you do a survey for the corporation and, and they're like, we're going to make big changes and then nothing happens. It's, it's kind of like, I mean, that's that feeling of like, well, then why should I even bother? Right? You want people to like, just, and this is about, about honesty. So those are the four ground conditions for change. And I really love those. I just use them as a checklist for a meeting. So just as a reminder, allowing time to process, allow people time to process. So you may introduce a change in one meeting. Expect there to be some subsequent meetings. This is about planning. You just know, like, I'm gonna introduce this prototyping change, and I can't, it, you know you're not gonna be able to introduce the change in one meeting and have it be done. You've gotta actually have a, repeat, uh, like a, a consistent plan to come after that. Again, sort of allowing people to, to process through it. So this is my favorite part. This is so relieving to me. Somewhere between one to 19% of people will disagree with your change. Okay, so that's easy. Just, you don't have to please everyone and you don't have to get everyone on board. There's 20%, up to 20% who, aren't, who will always disagree. So there's a couple of things you can do with that. So one is knowing that this is true, you can plan about how to, how to handle that, right? So how are you going to actually manage the, manage the people that disagree? Um, there's a couple of different things, like some of it's attrition, right? If you want to make a big change and there aren't people coming on board with you, maybe you don't want them on board with you. That's okay. They can go do something else that resonates more strongly with them. Um, so that's one thing. But the other thing that's really interesting is that sometimes the people who disagree with this change are the source of the next change. They're saying something that is important to the system. So you take the prototyping example, and I was trying to think of what, I'm imagining a wireframe holdout. I'm imagining somebody who's like, you know, God, I just, I make these beautiful deliverables. They, they, they work every time. I don't understand why I have to do all this new stuff. But like, there's a grain of truth in there someplace. We don't know what it is, right? But, so she may not, she may, you know, get her to do the prototyping, and I'll assume it's a her, get her to do the prototyping, but keep asking, like, what is, what's, what's underneath this? Like, what is it that she has a value that could be applied into the future? Right? So it, it doesn't, just because someone dis, dis, disagrees, that's not the end of the story. Right? It becomes a source of the next change. Um, and to me, that's enormously liberating. So this is the thing I'm going to leave you guys with. I dump a ton on you, and then you're going to process it. Um, but think about being thoughtful and mindful about how you create change. This is one of those examples of we're running so fast we don't stop to think about it. But think about it, like create a little space when you're gonna introduce something new, just go through it. What is the secondary I'm gonna be, that I'm moving them into the primary? What are the edges? How do I wanna handle those edges? What are the ground conditions for change? Have I met them? How do I wanna to address this change as it goes forward? And what am I gonna do with the 20%? Just a little bit thoughtful. Um, I just think it's really important to emotional engagement. And again, to the creativity and innovation that's possible in all of our teams. 
So that is my uh, thinking. If you're interested, I do a lot of tools and stuff, so you can come and drop me a line and I'll sign you up for my newsletter. Um, yeah, so thank you. <laughs>